Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, given that Easter is coming up, we thought it would be a good time for us to talk about Gethsemane, which is the moment in the New Testament when Christ is coming to terms with what's about to happen to him. And it's a it's an important scene in the New Testament, in the life of Christ. Uh, it's an important scene, we think, psychologically and mythologically. It relates to initiation, it relates to sacrifice, and it says something about the ego's relationship to the self in our psychological understanding of it. So we wanted to try to unpack that today. So as we prepare to move into this, I thought that I would read this small section from the book of Matthew so that the images and words are with us. Because I was raised Roman Catholic, uh, I'm going to read the King James Version. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, who are James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to the disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Thanks for reading that, Joseph. So just uh, for those of us who may need a refresher on this, or those of us perhaps from other faith traditions who may not know, uh, he's he's waiting there in Gethsemane. This is sort of after the Last Supper. Is that is that right? And then uh, Judas comes to him in Gethsemane and kisses him. And that is how the Romans recognize that this is their man. Gethsemane is sort of the, the the night that he passes in Gethsemane is him coming to grips with this whole thing that's about to go down that's going to result in his death. Uh, I find this the story itself, uh, and as I sat with it, um, thinking about what we were going to talk about, incredibly moving, uh, because Jesus knew what was going to happen. Uh, he knew that he would be betrayed. 
and uh, and he prays three times, and we can all identify with, oh my gosh, you know, please don't let this happen. If there's any way that I could possibly avoid this, um, it's so very human of him. And we see that side of of just a, a man like any other man. And that his disciples who are with him cannot stay awake. They cannot bear the the intensity Mm -hmm. of all the the psychological and spiritual intensity of all that is about to happen. And so they go unconscious. They fall asleep. And that's a motif in fairy tales uh, that at the very worst and most intense time, when it's too much to bear, uh, psyche can make us fall asleep and go unconscious. And it also speaks, I think, to the level of ego development that may be, in a way, it's uh, implied as a prerequisite uh, for being able to do this, that Jesus is alone in it. Uh, he is not accompanied by the disciples. He knows what's going to happen, and he uh, has to begin to bear it. It is on him alone. And what kind of development, strength, courage, faith, whatever words we might put on that, but it really speaks to a level of integrity that uh, is remarkable, of course. This biblical scene has some special significance for me. Um, my first year in training, so I'd just gotten into analytic training, and and we had this, uh, one of our teachers was an analyst who uh, was very interested in um, the Christian myth, I'll say. And she gave us an assignment to pick a scene from the New Testament and to write about it psychologically. And I remember my ego attitude was uh, sort of an eye roll <laughs> because I, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly interested in the Christian myth. Maybe I was, I was worried that this was going to be a little pedantic or, or something. And so, so I was, you know, I was reluctant. I had this kind of sense of arrogance, like that's not that interesting, but I immediately thought, well, I'm definitely going to do Gethsemane because it it is, it was always when I was a child, it was always so interesting and I, and moving perhaps to me that that Christ had this reaction of saying like oh I don't want to do this it's it's so it's so as as we say it's so relatable like wait you mean I have to do that oh I don't want to do that you know so I picked it and as I worked on it I felt really really gripped by it it kind of grabbed me and it threw me down and at one point in writing it, I had this just terrible back pain that resolved very much through a kind of psychological reckoning. You know, I, I had this, you know, experience of of being in, in pain and then coming to grips with something on an inner level and the back pain resolving. Um, so it was, it was a very moving experience to write it. And, and I, and I guess I feel like I want to give a little bit of personal history here. Uh, my parents were both raised Southern Baptist with fire and brimstone and snake handling, and both of them left the church as soon as they were adults. So my own religious uh, experience growing up was I didn't really have a religion. I wasn't baptized. We didn't go to church. I obviously had a kind of Christian heritage in the background, culturally, but I wasn't really exposed much to formal religion. So I, I want to say that <laughs> I feel like my catechism was actually Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, which if some of you are old enough to remember that, it was the um, movie and then later became a Broadway show um, written by, um, I believe it was Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber. And the Gethsemane scene in that film is is very very moving and the the lyrics um to that song it's a rock opera and Christ sings I only want to say if there is a way take this cup away from me for I don't want to taste its poison at the end 
He says, God, thy will is hard, but you hold every card. I will drink your cup of poison, nail me to your cross and break me, bleed me, beat me, kill me, take me now before I change my mind. You can really hear Christ's humanity in this segment, as we've already said. I think, Lisa, there is a way in which the universality of the story stirs us. It weaves its way into our personal history, just as you noticed with your own family and your own experience, finding your way into that mythopoetic system. And there's something so emotionally powerful and and even devastating in this story of sacrifice and willingness to submit to something horrific, even as it is moving upon us. And for Jung, this capacity to see what the self is demanding, to know that it is enormous, powerful, frightening, and to say yes to it anyway Mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. so central to our work. And as we've said many times, the relativization of the ego to the self, that the ego does need to submit to this higher force inside of us in order to fulfill its mission. And that it can be that big uh, from an ego point of view, that horrific, that much. There's a place where where Jung uh, talks about this, and he says the self, in its efforts at self-realization, reaches out beyond the ego personality on all sides. Because of its all-encompassing nature, it is brighter and darker than the ego and accordingly confronts it with problems which it would like to avoid. You have become the victim of a decision made over your head or in defiance of the heart. From this, we can see the numinous power of the self, which can hardly be experienced in any other way. For this reason, the experience of the self is always a defeat for the ego. It's become kind of a trope amongst Jungians to just quote the last part of that, that the experience of the self is a defeat for the ego. But I think uh, the story of Gethsemane really shows how touching and deep and big and real it is and what the cost is. Yeah, that that line, you know, it's a decision that's been made over your head. We all come to moments like this in our lives where we recognize something must be sacrificed and and it really goes down hard. And for most of us, we don't find ourselves in these life and death decisions. But what we're often asked to sacrifice is the addiction to familiarity, the addiction to the way in which we perceive safety, that when this transpersonal pressure manifests itself, that we are often up against the new, the unprecedented, the unpredictable. And so the confrontation with the self could look like something as banal as finally admitting that the career that you've spent 25 years building is horrible to you Mm -hmm. and it's devouring your health as well as other parts of your psychology and that the self through dreams and perhaps even other symptoms brings it to crisis that this simply cannot go on not one day more Mm -hmm. and that it will be costly to surrender a well-established career, to, to reinvent oneself in, in often a dramatic way. And yet, that is the realm that Jung was talking about. And Joseph, I, 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 I really love everything you said. And it's, it's also when we make such a sacrifice consciously, 
what awaits us is a rebirth. Jung talks about the difference between a kind of a conscious sacrifice, which is very much what Christ does in Gethsemane. Like, like the fact that he suffers in Gethsemane shows us that he is conscious of what's, mm-hmm. what's about to happen. So the difference between a conscious and an unconscious sacrifice, Jung says, the daimon throws us down, makes us traitor to our ideals and cherished convictions, traitors to the selves we thought we were. This is an unmitigated catastrophe because it is an unwilling sacrifice. Things go very differently when the sacrifice is a voluntary one. Then it is no longer an overthrow, a transvaluation of values, the destruction of all that we held sacred, but transformation. So the Gethsemane moment for each of us is the recognition that there's a real sacrifice to be made here, and are we going to make it? The alternative to suffering, which is conscious, the conscious acceding to the necessity of the sacrifice. The alternative is to protest, to be thrown into despair, uh, to revolt. Those are the places that ego goes when, when, you know, the gods, the fates are against us versus being able to accept, say yes, and submit in a conscious way. And that's what leads to the transformation, that the decision has been made over our head. Of course, our ego wants to protest, take action, and change things. And that is so much a part of the uh, story of Jesus in Gethsemane, of one of the people with Jesus, you know, does attack uh, the people who are uh, with the um, people who are going to arrest Jesus and uh, cuts off the um, an ear of one of the slaves and Jesus says, no, put your, put your sword back into its place. Uh, for all who take the sword will perish by the for- sword. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? And so uh, it, it's a wonderful illustration of I could choose the power of my ego to change this path, but I will not. Yeah, but I, and in some sense I cannot because it's a decision made over my head. Yeah. So we have this moment then, and there is this temptation, just like Christ had a temptation to call upon his father and say, hey, dad, send me 12 legions of angels. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and then what do we do with that? And, uh, you know, Marie-Louise von Franz writes about this in, in such a profound way. She's writing about this fairy tale called The Two Travelers, in which there's a threat that one of the brothers is gonna go, going to get hanged on the gallows. So he, here's the quote from, this is in um, The Shadow and Evil in Fairy Tales. She says, You see this sometimes in the case of a young man who should marry or choose a profession or discovers that the fullness of youth is leaving him and that he has to accept the ordinary human fate. At the critical time between 30 and 40, the tree is growing against them. Their inner development is no longer in tune with the conscious attitude but grows against it, and in that moment they have to suffer a kind of death. It should mean a change in attitude, but may mean actual physical death, a kind of disguised suicide, because the ego cannot give up its attitude. This is the crucial moment where they are sacrificed by a process of inner development which has turned against them. Again, she's talking about the gallows and the fairy tale, but she amplifies it also to uh, include the, the. She links the get the gallows to the tree Yggdrasil that Wotan hangs upon in his sacrifice, and 
also to the cross of the crucifixion. So what she's saying there essentially is that many of us, especially in this kind of transition to uh, kind of a midlife transition between 30 and 40, we have to give something up. We have to sacrifice something. And that some people won't make the sacrifice and instead will will sort of choose a, a kind of a sacrifice of their life, which she calls an involuntary suicide. And I think she mentions, and if I'm not mistaken, around that passage, like they'll go to war, for example, or or they may have a motorcycle accident or something like that, rather than submit to this change of attitude. She she says something similar a little bit later. She says, whenever the conscious and animal personality is in conflict with the inner process of growth, it suffers crucifixion. It is in the situation of the God suspended on the tree and is involuntarily nailed to an unconscious development from which it would like to break away but cannot we are nailed down to something greater than ourselves, which does not allow us to move and which outreaches us. So can we submit to that process, that painful, painful process? You know, one somewhat conventional example of that, because I've worked with a handful of artists over the years, is writer's block. I mean, I know that's bringing it down to a much less dramatic context, but I think about people who write professionally and then find in the midst of a very robust career that all of a sudden they cannot write. They can't bring forward ideas. Their career feels like it's locked and they may spend years trying to resuscitate the way in which they had created previously and find that something substantial has to be sacrificed mm -hmm. at the level of ego before the unconscious will release the wellspring and allow the creativity to flow again. And in my observations, that is often a tremendous reappraisal of who one is and how one has been living. And the meticulous sorting through of all these things that frankly, the ego would just rather move on from rather than have to chew on them and extract both the poison from them, but also the medicine in them. And often the poison and the medicine mythologically are the same thing. You know, your example, I, I'm appreciating because it uh, illustrates the spectrum along which a Gethsemane moment can occur. And of course, the biblical story, it makes it very, very big and has moved millions of people for thousands of years. But we experience it in something like writer's block also, where something from the unconscious and the self presses upon us to force uh, the ego to recognize its limitations. And of course, ego wants to go back to doing it the way it always did it. And actually, Gethsemane, the word itself, uh, has a reference to pressing uh, because it was the place where olive oil is pressed. And uh, so the pressing of the olives to squeeze out all the, the oil that was an incredible food staple in uh, the, the Middle East, uh, really is a great image of, of trial and distress and agony. And then there is this elixir of, of the oil, which uh, is related to spirit, illumination, and something that flows where there's movement, uh, liquidity the spirit in motion. Uh, so I, I may be extending this metaphor uh, a little over much, but nevertheless, there, there it is. Yeah, it's, that's perfect. <laughs> that that's, <laughs> that's the origin of the term Gethsemane, because I think it, it does underscore, you know, what we've been saying that, that when you allow yourself 
to be put through this excruciating process, something comes of it. There is new life on the other side. There is a rebirth. It is a submission on the part of the ego to the demands of the unconscious for the purpose of greater growth and new fertilization. And on a larger scale, I would also add that when the self is acting, even through an individual, it is participating not only in the microcosmic world of the individual, but it is also incarnating something of the collective and thereby making it available to humanity writ large. That the self in the story of uh, Jesus is pressing for an individual to make a choice that ostensibly will change the course of history. And Jung had a really rather radical realization that the self needs the ego as much as the ego needs the self. Mm. That the collective unconscious is enhanced, is improved by the experiences that human beings feed back into it, and that the world itself is matured through the content of the collective that is manifested through the individual. So coming back to the idea of the person who is destined to write a book, but in order to write that book, the ego has to be reconfigured. And that book is not just for them, not just for their career, but actually has a role in the collective in a way that cannot be seen and might not be understood for a lifetime. You're also speaking, uh, you know, really poignantly to the importance of consciousness. To choose implies consciousness of that, that I am willing uh, I will do this versus just being, you know, overcome, uh, kind of tackled mid-stride, that the ego has to be enough to meet its fate, to meet the self, to make the sacrifice, to accede, to have a relationship with the collective unconscious, the self, the what is greater, and and in a way, isn't that the whole thread of Jungian ideas is to have the relationship, the back and forth, the dialogue, the recognition on the part of ego of, of what is greater, and actually to have that be a living relationship. And both, they need each other. And that was what was so unique for Jung, is that it made a difference. God, the self, valued uh, the consciousness of man, and it has an impact on something greater, as did Jesus on the cross, according to the Christian myth. It had his sacrifice, had an impact as savior. You bring up something that for me is really important about this scene that is it's something that I, I feel like I learned uh, when I was working on this paper. And I, I think I use it all the time now in my life and in my practice, which is, you know, Jesus prays to God when he's in Gethsemane. He sinks into prayer, as we heard before. God doesn't answer. He he doesn't say, you know, geez, dad, I'm I'm just not really feeling it. What do you think? And then God comes down and says, nah, I think you got to do it. You know, he 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 raises up the question, but then he has to sit with the question himself and come up with the answer. And I'm I'm thinking, Deb, about you're talking about the relationship between the ego and the self and how the self needs the ego. The ego needs to be able to consult the self, to be open to the will of the self. But ultimately, it's consciousness that has to make the decision. 
So a lot of times people come into Jungian analysis and they feel like, well, if I can just understand my dreams, then I won't have to make any conscious decisions. Now, that's what the, that's not what they're thinking consciously, but part of what they want is they want to be able to use their dreams as a kind of oracle. So they don't have to take conscious responsibility for their actions. Because if you get a voice from on high saying, you know, you should go to law school, then you don't have to think about it. You, you don't have to take conscious responsibility for that decision because the voice from on high told you to do it. So there's something about that sinking into a place of kind of prayerful concentration, wanting to make contact with the self energy, and yet knowing that at the end of the day, it's the ego that acts in the world. It's the ego that has to make the decision. And there are no guarantees. Uh, that is the price. You have to walk down that road by yourself. It's not a deal. You know, as you were really talking about, Lisa, that don't worry. You know, if you do this for me, I'll do that for you. No, we have to take it on ourselves to decide, not knowing. And I think something inside of us recognizes the difference between suffering that one has chosen to accept versus suffering that has been thrust upon us. And when we think of people who have both risked great harm or perhaps experienced great suffering because of a decision, perhaps even a heroic decision, we see them as heroes versus people who have had suffering thrust upon them and we see them as victims. Mm. And suffering, of course, is, is valid in both environments. But there is something exalting about choosing to suffer in service to something that is meaningful enough to carry the ego through that experience. And I might say that that sums up the entire analytic path. As we've said before, there is an illegitimate suffering or a neurotic suffering, where people, in a sense, kind of spin around a teapot, talking about something that isn't at the crux of their problem or misdirecting themselves even, let alone their analysts, to talk about something that isn't significant to the life path versus discovering the actual nexus of the issue and doing whatever one can to lay hands upon it and to accept it and to find a way to metabolize it, to be in relationship to it and to it allow it to change you and sometimes the things that we are avoiding change us in a way that is, at first, excruciating. And only in hindsight can we say that this was the right choice. I want to see if I can bring this down to an individual example. And I'm going to use this example from a radio program. In January of 1997, the National Public Radio program, This American Life, uh, broadcast an episode that was called Should Have Been Dead. It included this extraordinary interview with Kevin Kelly. So Kevin Kelly is the founding editor of Wired Magazine and has had a really interesting career. He's done all kinds of uh, really quite uh, amazing things, uh, including he helped found the All Species Foundation. Is probably best known for for founding Wired, and he did this interview with Ira Glass of This American Life. We'll we'll put a link to it in the show notes. You can listen to the interview. It's about fifteen minutes long, and it's really remarkable. But I'm going to give a little summary here. So when he was twenty seven. He was a freelance photographer, and he was traveling the world. And he happened to find himself in Jerusalem at Easter. At that time, he was confused about religion, and he felt really unresolved. You know, he's, he asked himself, is, is God real? And, and if he is, so what, what do you do about that? So he's, he's in Jerusalem at Easter, and he gets locked out of his hostel that night. So he spent the night wandering around the old city. And when it started to get cold, he went inside the only open building he found, which was a church. 
And it happened to be the Church of the Holy Scepter, which was reputedly built on the crucifixion site. He said the only place to lie down was on a marble slate in the church that supposedly commemorated the exact location of the cross. So, I, I mean, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, oh, these are synchronicities. So he slept there until early morning when tourists began coming in. He says he followed the crowds to the tombs and found himself at sunrise staring at the empty tombs. And as he sat contemplating the scene, it was like his doubts were just suddenly removed. He, he, he just knew. He just knew that Jesus had risen from those tombs. And he said, in an instant, the tension of trying to figure things out was resolved because now suddenly everything was figured out. He went back to his hostel and he had all these questions. He's like, okay, so if God is real, what, what do I do about it? So he just kind of let himself sit with this question. And uh, he was thinking about it as he was napping. And then he says, and, and I wouldn't say it was a voice, but there was an idea that came into my mind that just would not go away, that I should live as if I would die in six months. That was the assignment. So again, if we're thinking about a sort of a conversation between the ego and the self, we can see that this young man, 27, right, right on the cusp of the Saturn return, was having this real kind of dialogue between the ego and the self. And the self is really, really wanting to catch him and make a point. So he says that it seems completely irrational to, to live as if you're going to die in six months, but it felt like something he wanted to do. So it felt, it felt like something he had to do. So he, he found himself thinking, okay, so if I were going to die in six months, what would I do? And he says the answer surprised him. The conclusion that I came to was that I wanted to, what I wanted to do for six months was to go home and be ordinary, to go back to my parents to help them take out the trash and trim the hedges and move furniture around and to be with them. And I was really shocked by that because I thought that with six months to live, I would climb Mount Everest or I would go scuba diving to the depths of the ocean or get in a speedboat and see how fast I could go. But instead, I wanted to go back home and be with my family for that time. So again, this is a sacrifice of an ego attitude, right? It would be like sort of an ego-driven thing to go climb Mount Everest or scuba dive to the depths of the ocean. And he's 27 and he's traveling the world. So to go back home to New Jersey and be ordinary, it, it's a, that's a real sacrifice for a, a 20, 27-year-old. And, and I'm, I'm thinking again about that Marie Louise von Franz passage about sort of accepting the ordinary human fate. And so here it is. So he, he does this. He goes, he goes back to New Jersey and he says, things were unbelievably ordinary. And yet I found myself relishing the ordinariness and finding it in some ways as exotic as anything that I had traveled to see. So eventually he decides to take a bike trip across country to see his brothers and sisters one last time. He gave away his few possessions. He wrote cashier's checks to friends, giving away the last of his cash. And while he's on this trip to visit his siblings, he fought this tendency to think about his own future. He, he would see a book and think, oh, I'm, I'm going to buy that because maybe I'll want to read that someday. But he, he would train himself not to think about the future. So he does this bike trip and he arrives back home six months to the date that he was uh, in Jerusalem, and it, it happens to be Halloween. So he says, um, it was a journey that began at the tomb of Jesus, and as I set off to my own presumed death, I did indeed think about Jesus Christ. We have this history in the Gospels of Jesus' torment and his soul as he approached what he knew of his time to die. So it was that very harsh information of knowing when you are going to die. And I think I did experience some of that. Jesus prayed that this burden would be lifted. And there are days when I did pray that if I didn't have to die, I really would rather not. But what we're seeing, of course, is that Kelly suffered a kind of psychic death. He allowed himself to die psychologically. So he arrived back at his parents from visiting his siblings on Halloween he describes his reunion dinner with his parents as wonderful, but not special. He says of it that it was an ordinary evening. 
the kind of one that you might have a memory about as you were dying. Kelly describes handing out the candy to the children that came to trick-or-treating, and, and eventually he went to sleep. And here's what he says. He says, And I went to bed that night, which was a very difficult thing to do, because I was fully prepared at that moment never to wake up again. I had been praying. I had gotten everything arranged. I had fully gone through in my own mind and my own soul all the things I might have regretted, and I had righted as many of those as I had thought I could through letters, and I was prepared as much as anybody could be to die. So I went to bed while the kids were still ringing the doorbells. I went to sleep because I was very tired after that long trip, and I didn't know what was going to happen. So we got to the end of the interview, and Kelly is talking about things that had happened about 20 years before, but his voice still breaks. He says, The next morning I woke up and it was as if I had my entire life again. I had my future again. There was nothing special about the day. It was a rather ordinary day. I was reborn into ordinariness. But what more could one ask for? What that evokes in me is the incredible intervention of the self to take somebody whose attachment had been wounded and to reattach them to life, to reattach them to their family, to their fate, to their own talents, to their own body, and how absolutely life-renewing it is to be reinvested in one's life. And with a very different attitude, of humility, gratitude to have been reborn, great thankfulness, uh, and a sense of purpose that is not just about me, but living in service, knowing the gift you have been given. It's an incredibly moving story for all of us. This was just a regular guy who dedicated himself to living out what he experienced uh, that morning at the tombs. Yeah, I think it's this this idea about being reborn into ordinariness. Mm -hmm. It was a real sacrifice of sort of an ego orientation toward um, inflation. And uh, one of the phrases that uh, Jungians use all over and over again is the relativization of the ego, that he knew in a way that he would carry with him, I'm sure, that his ego was relative to something greater, and hence he can be ordinary. Uh, having been led by, undergirded by, and in service to something greater. I would definitely recommend listening to the whole thing. It's really, it's a great, great piece of radio. It also evokes the idea of redemption. Yeah, one way of thinking about redemption is to buy back. And there's a way in which he has bought back his life. Mm Mm-hmm as you said, his ordinary life or his familiar life and how meaningful and saving that was for him. I think that we are often seduced into admiring people who seem to be doing extraordinary things in this world of Instagram fame. Some people Great numbers of people travel the world, create Instagram followings, Mm -hmm. do extraordinary things and promote them as a way of uh, garnering a career of one kind or another. There's a way in which many postings are about exaltation, self-exaltation, and seeing how that can be monetized. And to be able to step away from the seduction of that. And to understand that there is something greater than us that invests life with meaning. And that even the most ordinary things can be invested with a level of meaning that can carry us 
for a lifetime. You know, I want to say something else about th- about this. Um, sorry. It's okay. It's it's it is so meaningful that this is rumbling through you. Well, that's what I want to address. Is that you know this this really affected me when I wrote this yeah. paper twenty years ago. Yeah. And it still does. And I think it speaks to the power of the archetype. Mm-hmm. That it's 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 a story that's alive. At least it's very alive for me. A phrase from a Rumi poem is coming up to me. Our tears improve the earth. Weeping about the right things adds something to life. Topically, what this is bringing forward for me is this tension between the secularization of life versus the sacralization of life, which I think speaks very much to Jung's cry in his writings for the reimagining of the religious instinct, the religious impulse. Jung had a sense in his own imagination that although he was born in the modern era, that his psyche was more akin to a 12th century man. And that meant many different things for him, of course. But one of the things that it meant was his natural penchant to move through the world and to see it as sacred, to see it as imbued with spiritual energy, which he came to call the archetypes, but on an experiential level, to be able to see the hand of God in the most ordinary of things. And isn't that a very beautiful paradox that the sacralization of the world uh, is right here in front of us in the most ordinary of ways? to wake up as uh, Kevin Kelly did the next morning and, and embrace life. And it's right here for us. I can't think of anything that the world needs more than for us to resacralize life as this very profound uh, Easter time story does as Kevin Kelly lived, and as Jung strove to do, many voices, many mythologies. It's right here in front of us. Uh, What wants to come through us into the world? What are we in service to? How do we love this life and the world around us? What are we living for? Well, and you know that that point about the resacralization of life i think is an incredibly important one and of course when we're talking about gethsemane we are talking about the sacrificial moment we are talking about the the moment in which christ came to terms with sacrificing himself and sacrifice means to make sacred so when we make these conscious sacrifices of our dearly held attitudes, when we allow ourselves to be thrown down, when we submit to that decision that was made over our heads, we, we are reinvesting life with sacredness. And on a feeling level, one of the evidences that something has been sacralized is there is a rebirth of beauty in the thing that we had been overlooking. And beauty and sacredness lay side by side, I think, in the psyche. As horrific as the crucifixion image is in the Christian mythopoetic system, the sacredness of it makes it both horrifying and beautiful because of its implication that all of humanity has been redeemed 
through this act of overwhelming suffering, that something which is horrifying becomes venerated and beautiful. So I, I have had small moments like that as well, where something that was ordinary either regains its beauty or that there is a beauty that's discovered that one could not have imagined. And I think that that is also an essential part of analysis, is for the analyst and the analysand to delve deep enough into the personal experience to reveal the archetypal underpinning, and in that revelation, discover something that is beautiful, even if its expression in the moment occludes that. And perhaps it's time for us to transition into a dream. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During Dream School's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. Today our dreamer is a 24-year-old male who is the head stalker at a grocery store. And here's his dream. I'm on the YouTube show Good Mythical Morning. The two hosts are dumping buckets of spiders on me. They start with daddy long legs. I hunch over and can feel them tickling my back. Then a bigger black type of spider. Then the last bucket is scorpions. I stay hunched over, covering my head. With each bucket, I can feel the insects tickling me, but that's it. For context, he says, I'm nearing the end of a fiction book I'm writing. It is the first creative project I've ever fully committed to. The main feeling in the dream he mentions is that he's scared but knows they wouldn't hurt him at the same time. And then he woke up, and he was curled up, and his back was tingling. He offers a bit more explanation. Spiders are a common motif in my dreams, but there's usually only one. I was also raised a Baptist, but am agnostic now. I bring that up because the pouring of bugs kind of reminds me of baptism. Well, just starting at the beginning, he's on a YouTube show called Good Mythical Morning. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the dream maker hits us in the face with a wet cod, just <laughs> <laughs> declaring this is a dream about myth. You know, it's just totally unambivalent. We're in the realm of myth. You know, it's interesting because I um, was unfamiliar with that YouTube show, but there is a YouTube show called Good Mythical Morning. It does not appear at my cursory glance to have anything to do with myth. <laughs> um, but yes, I think you're right, Joseph. I think that the dream maker chose that very advisedly. Yes, here we are in the mythical realm. And yet there is, um, at least in uh, my own uh, reaction to this, uh, there's some humor in it. There's a YouTube show, and uh, it's, it's, there, there's something good humored, easygoing, uh, you know, and not too grandiose about it. 
and even the name itself is a kind of a delightful, almost like a children's story kind of feeling, like good mythical morning. And then the the contrast of the two hosts are dumping buckets of spiders on me. So so it's interesting because he likens that being having the spiders poured on him as a um a baptism, but it it also feels like a kind of trial or an ordeal. Mm-hmm that one might have to go to. And of course it's, we're noting that there are three, three times. It's a fairy tale. A, it's a, a significant number. You know, there is something about fully committing to something, fully committing to a project. Like I'm going to sit my butt in this chair every day and write this novel that, that it is, it is a little bit like going through an ordeal. It is having to withstand the discomfort of uh, having spiders poured all over you, you know, it's seeing if you are up to the task. I'm aware that spiders are sometimes associated mythologically with the mother and in particular the negative mother. And I'm, I'm thinking that scorpions are probably in that same uh, neighborhood, but I know Deb, you've got some information there about scorpions. Uh, well, scorpions according to a reference that we use often and uh, certainly have a lot of enthusiasm about. This is called the Book of Symbols, Reflections on Archetypal Images, published by Taschen, T-A-S-C-H-E-N. And it's a fabulous uh, reference. And scorpions are um, the oldest uh, arachnid. And, of course, they can wield death sting. They have an exoskeleton. Really, I think just the word itself evokes a very kind of powerful ancient image. Certainly um, a great intensification from the daddy long legs that the dreamer is first uh, doused with. So there's something about having scorpions poured on your back or even spiders that means something about having to withstand the fear of death. This was another one of those cases where we knew we were going to be talking about this topic today. I went to the pile of dreams and sort of, I usually try to pick one of the top ones. I was attracted to this one because it came from a male dreamer. But once I picked it, I thought, oh, and it relates to our topic today. I mean, this is, this is a, a topic in a sense about sacrificing an ego attitude to let this happen to you, to let yourself be doused with spiders or scorpions and to, to withstand that, to not assert your will and say, heck no, I'm not going to do that. It does bring up a question if I tie this into the young man's life, that it seems like he's in some kind of a test but it's unclear what the prize is at the moment. And if I were to take this and amplify it with a fairy tale, very briefly, it's the story of the youth who went forth to learn what fear was. And so in this fairy tale, this father has two sons, and the younger son, when asked by his father what he'd like to learn to support himself, he says that he'd like to learn how to shudder. And so he goes to the church and the sexton um, tries to scare him, pretending he's a ghost and the boy's not afraid. And then he's set under the gallows where these men had been hung and they shake in the winds, but he's not, doesn't shudder. And then uh, he's uh, besieged by demonic cats and dogs that jump out from the corners. And then these men come in and try to frighten him with a coffin. And one thing after another is presented to him, but the boy is able to be resilient. And the reward is that he's able to marry the king's daughter because he's able to withstand these challenges. And and then, uh, funnily enough, on the wedding night, the boy is continuing to complain that if only I could shudder. And because it is their wedding night, the wife is incredibly irritated by him saying this <laughs> constantly. And so she sends somebody out to get a bucket of ice cold water and fish from the local stream. And then when he's sleeping, throws it on top of him upon uh, which he wakes up and says, I finally know what it's like to shudder. So it's interesting that it's the, 
heroic journey, Mm -hmm. his Mm -hmm. ability to withstand the spiders and scorpions and to experience them as kind of tickling, that it's passing a kind of test. Yes. And if we think about the fairy tale, it is possible that the test is leading to the winning of the princess or the winning of um, the opportunity to mature into another level of psycho-spiritual growth. And as he continues to grow, and the anima particularly becomes more active in the psyche, that it actually is this connection to some aspect of the unconscious, which in the beginning of the fairy tale is blocked, that he's able to gain some access to this human experience of being somewhat overwhelmed. So I'm thinking of the writing of the book and that creative endeavor, and that there's something about the endeavor requires him to not only overcome his superficial fears, but also find his way to a level of vulnerability to the inner world. Because I think that's indicated in the fairy tale by the bride who finally introduces him to this vulnerability where he can shudder in response to sensation. So I think there's, he's in the middle of a journey. And at this point, he's just passed the three tests. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of wondering what the next act is going to be for him. Yeah. And I mean, finishing a novel is, is also, you know, kind of the end of an, you know, the passing of an ordeal, because if you, if you have this thought, Hey, I think I could write a novel. It does take a certain kind of commitment. You you probably are not getting a lot of sort of feedback from the world that this is a good way to spend your time. It can be enormously fun and rewarding to sit down and write, but, but sometimes it it's, frustrating and to get all the way through it requires a certain kind of perseverance. So I I think I'm picking up Joseph on what you're saying about sort of passing the initial test that he could identify something of his own, a creative urge that he was going to commit himself to and see it all the way through. I'm wanting to go a little bit in the other direction and wonder if uh, since all three of these trials are the same, dumping spiders and then finally the scorpion, the scorpion is really a creature of the underworld. Uh, and it has a very hard exoskeleton. You know, unlike most spiders, they don't have a real shell the way the scorpion does. It's associated, of course, with Scorpio, the astrological sign. It's about darkness. It's about the underworld. It's more than just the third bucket being being dumped. It's a kind of uh, symbol, I think, that has a, a potency and a richness, but also a reality about darkness, death, predation, stinging, that I think it really demands some uh, reflection, introspection, and maybe some active imagination. Moving in that direction with you, Deb, there is this um, escalation, right? Because Mm -hmm. daddy long legs don't even have mouths. They can't bite you. They can't hurt you. Um, They exist only briefly to breed. And then that's the end of them. Really? That's so sad. (laughs) Yeah. And then the evolution to the scorpions, you know, which are, potent and stinging Mm -hmm. and nipping and potentially deadly potentially although from my friends who were raised in the midwest apparently scorpions are a little bit like roaches they kind of show up in your shower and they really can sting you a little bit like bees uh, yellow jackets and most people are kind of fine with it but they're kind of ubiquitous in certain parts of the united states and other parts of the world but there is this movement from the harmless daddy long leg to the lethal, I suppose, stinging scorpion. So something is mounting in the psyche, and he is able to be resilient to all of it, which I think is rather remarkable. 
I'm also wondering if the dream is preparing him for the kind of scrutiny that his novel is going to get as he moves towards showing it to other people, perhaps having it edited professionally. I'd have to say, speaking with people who write novels, it feels like a thousand scorpions are biting you. Like every time someone says, oh, take that sentence out. Oh, that character doesn't work. Change this name. We're going to redesign this whole chapter. For writers, it's excruciating. I mean, it feels like part of their body is being, you know, chopped off when their novel is being manhandled by uh, editorial staff. So I wonder if the dream maker is building a certain kind of resilience into the dream uh, ego so that it can tolerate the crawling all over his manuscript and the pokey nippy things that are that are going to happen if someone takes an interest in his manuscript. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.